If you have a cousin with a YouTube and vocal cords, you've probably heard the theory that the Ashkenazi Jews aren't really Jews at all. They're simply Jew-ish. But is there any truth to this? I'm Dara Star Tucker, and this is The Breakdown. This theory that Ashkenazi Jews are not really of Middle Eastern ancestry, but are descended from an ancient Turkic civilization called the Khazars, who converted to Judaism, has gained popularity with the rise of social media. It's been adopted by all sorts of celebrities and even the Palestinian president, but it's not really new. So where did this theory come from? And is it historically accurate? And why does your cousin love it so much? Now, to be clear, I have no intention of taking you through the complete history of the Jewish people. In fact, the goal here is not to get too bogged down with the details so we can focus specifically on this theory and whether or not it has any validity. But I want to give you the bare minimum primer on who and what we're talking about here. It's important to understand that Judaism is an ethno-religion, though it certainly has its converts. Ethnically, Jewish people are made up of two primary denominations, Sephardim and Ashkenazim. Sephardic Jews are descended from the Jews who migrated to the Iberian Peninsula, or modern-day Spain and Portugal, after being exiled from the ancient kingdom of Judah by the Babylonians in 597 BCE, and again by the Romans in 70 CE. They were then expelled from Spain in 1492 by the Alhambra Decree. Sephardic Jews then landed in the Balkans, Southern Europe, and North Africa. The Roman exile of 70 CE also displaced Ashkenazi Jews. They largely landed in the Danube Valley and Rhineland areas, which is modern-day Germany and Austria. Today, Jewish people can be found in every part of the world, and the majority of them are Ashkenazi. But right around the beginning of the 19th century, a small group of scholars began to theorize that Ashkenazi Jews were not really the descendants of the Semitic-speaking people who were exiled from the Kingdom of Judah in modern-day Israel all the way back in 70 CE. These writers proposed that the Ashkenazim were, in fact, descended from the Khazarian Empire, a group of semi-nomadic Turkic people made up of various ethnicities that lived in southeastern European Russia, southern Ukraine, Crimea, and Kazakhstan that was established in the 7th century. The Khazars' primary religion is thought to have been Tengriism, although there were also Jewish, Christian, and Muslim Khazars. The Khazars remained in the Caucasus region from the 7th century through the 10th century. There were reports that a small portion of the Khazars converted to Rabbinic Judaism in the 8th century, but that can't be substantiated. The Khazar theory posits that when the Khazar Empire fell in the 10th century, there was a huge population of Khazarian Jewish converts that migrated from the Caucasus region to modern-day Eastern and Western Europe. The Khazar theory says that these are the people that we now identify as Ashkenazi Jews, making Ashkenazi Jews not ethnically Middle Eastern Jews by bloodline, but Far Eastern European and Western Asian converts to Judaism, thus rendering them ineligible for any right to return to their homeland in Israel. Now, where exactly did this theory come from, and is there any validity to it? Well, historians started to speculate about this in the early 19th century, but one of the primary proponents of this theory was a white supremacist and Semitic scholar named Ernest Renan. He was a Frenchman who wrote a hugely popular book in 1863 called Life of Jesus, where he claimed that Jesus was able to purify himself of his Jewish traits and become an Aryan Christian. This was considered scholarly writing at the time. In the same book, he claimed that Judaism was foolish and illogical and that Christianity was the superior religion. The theory was rooted in eugenics and anti-Semitism, and those things started to fall out of favor by the 1930s when the Nazi party began using them to justify the genocide of the Jews. Jewish people in Europe. After that, the theory was referenced intermittently by scholars, but remained a largely obscure one. Then a man named Arthur Kessler wrote a book called The Thirteenth Tribe in 1976, and the theory picked up a whole new audience. Now it wasn't just something that scholars were talking about. Everyday people were taking the theory and running with it if it suited their purposes. But it had no more substantiation then than it did in Ernest Renan's day. What had changed was the reason for reiterating this theory. Instead of coming from a white supremacist who was bent on undermining the Jewish faith, this time it was being validated by a Jewish man who thought that if he could prove that most Eastern European Jews, the ancestors of modern-day Ashkenazim, were really ethnically European and not ethnically Jewish, he could get rid of anti-Semitism completely. What Kessler didn't anticipate is that his book would have the opposite effect. He essentially stoked the fires of anti-Semitism by bolstering the idea that Ashkenazi Jews had no claim to Israel and, according to some, were not a legitimate ethnic group at all. 
Neo-Nazis were even praising it. Kessler admitted that his evidence was scant since very little remains of the Khazar civilization. Much of the research that he referenced has been discredited by respected scholars who are experts in anthropology, etymology, and ancient civilizations. Attempting to substantiate this theory with solid archaeological, genetic, or linguistic evidence is a near impossibility. The Khazars, whose ancient civilization fell over a thousand years ago, were a multi-ethnic polyglot society, meaning they didn't represent a single ethnicity and they spoke a variety of languages and there are no distinct, identifiable descendants of the Khazars. Despite the difficulty of providing any solid proof of this theory, it continues to be promoted by a small group of writers and scholars, most notably Tel Aviv University professor of history Shlomo Sand and Tel Aviv University professor of linguistics Paul Wexler, as well as the geneticist Aaron al -Haik. But from an anthropological standpoint, the theory doesn't really hold up, even when placed under the most basic of scrutiny. Number one, is there archaeological evidence to support the theory? Number two, does linguistic evidence support the theory? And three, is there genetic evidence to support the theory? Societies usually leave behind historical relics, documents and data that help us to understand who they were and what they valued. Archaeologically, there is very little evidence to support the idea that there was a significant Jewish presence in ancient Khazaria. What we do know is that some Khazarians probably embraced Judaism, just as there were Christians and Muslims in that society, but their primary religion is thought to have been Tengriism. We know that the ruling elite may very well have converted to Judaism, but there is absolutely no evidence to suggest that those conversions were widespread. After the fall of Khazaria to the Russians in the 10th century, the next historical record of a Jewish presence in that region is in the 14th century in western Ukraine and Belarus, where Jewish people are referred to frequently. But again, there's absolutely no historical evidence to connect those people to the ancient Khazarians that were conquered centuries before. The linguistic argument doesn't hold up either. Since the 17th century, Yiddish has been the dominant language of all Ashkenazi Jews in Central Europe. This happened because Ashkenazi Jews settled in the Rhineland and Danube Valley territories, modern-day Germany and Austria. Now, there are very few written records of any Khazaric languages that exist in the modern era. We can only deduce that their language might closely relate to other languages native to Turkic regions. Very few linguists would support the argument that Yiddish contains much influence from the languages spoken in the Turkic region where Khazars would have resided. Yiddish is a vernacular language based primarily on High German, fused with influences from the Hebrew language, Aramaic, Slavic languages, and even some traces of Romantic languages. But even the most cursory analysis of German and Yiddish would make it clear that they are in fact sister tongues. Any argument that Yiddish is more Turkic than German could probably be applied to a vast array of languages. Yiddish, the dominant language spoken by most Ashkenazi Jews, has no etymological relationship to any language currently spoken in the Khazar region. But the field of onomastics gives us some of the strongest evidence that there is little to no connection between the Rhineland and Danube Valley Ashkenazi Jews and the ancient Khazar civilization. Onomastics is the study of proper names. In these Jewish communities living in Eastern Europe that were supposedly the descendants of the Khazars, a Turkic people, there are absolutely no Turkic names recorded over the the last six centuries, either first names or surnames. You'll find names that reference the complex history of the Yiddish language, Germanic names, Aramaic names, Polish names, even a few Greek, French, and Slavic names, but no Turkic names, none, because that is not their culture. It never was. And finally, are there genetic ties between Ashkenazi Jews and the ancient Khazars? Well, the first issue with trying to prove this theory genetically is that there are no obvious descendants of the Khazars. Let's remember that the Khazars, whose kingdom was vanquished by the Russian Empire over a thousand years ago, were a Turkic people who resided in the Northern Caucasus region. But recently, a scientist named Eran al Haik attempted to prove the Khazar connection by showing that there was a genetic tie with today's Ashkenazi Jews and ancient Khazars. He did this by comparing the DNA of eight Ashkenazi Jews with the DNA of a sample group called Proto-Khazars from Georgia and Armenia that supposedly emerged from the same genetic cohort as the ancient Khazars. But he failed to acknowledge that no contemporary historians consider either Georgians or Armenians to be Proto-Khazars. In other words, linking those ethnic groups to Ashkenazim does nothing to prove that the Ashkenazim are genetically connected to ancient Khazars. Any connection they do share is likely due to their shared Middle Eastern lineage. But there's a much more straightforward method for disproving this theory than simply proving that there is no genetic tie between ethnic Ashkenazim and the supposed descendants of ancient Khazars. It has to do with looking at the genetic makeup of Ashkenazim all over the world and comparing it 
with other Ashkenazi. The great thing about recent advances in the field of gene research is that questions like this are no longer shrouded in mystery as they once were. Thanks to an extensive analysis of Jewish people worldwide, we now know that ethnically Jewish people have strong genetic commonalities. A study published in the American Journal of Human Genetics conducted a genome-wide analysis on 237 people from Jewish communities in Eastern Europe, Syria, Italy, Iraq, Iran, Greece, and Turkey, and compared their genetic profiles to non-Jewish people in the the same regions. Researchers found a genetic thread that wove each of these Jewish populations together regardless of where they were in the world. This study goes a long way to disprove the theory that the Jewish people are not a legitimate ethnic group, and it establishes once and for all that there are clear genetic markers that can determine a person's connection to their Jewish ancestry. Now it's important to note that the study also determined that there was an extensive intermixing with non-Jewish Europeans among Ashkenazi Jews from the 15th century through the 19th century, when the Jewish Jewish population in Europe exploded from 50,000 to 5 million people. For that reason, most Ashkenazim today have a mix of Middle Eastern and Western and Eastern European ancestry. So Ashkenazi Jews did in fact migrate from the Middle East to modern day Germany. But if the Khazars didn't convert to Judaism en masse and migrate to Eastern Europe and become Ashkenazim, where did they go? Well, according to most historians, nowhere. The Khazars gradually intermixed with the Turkic and Kuman populations around them and eventually disappeared as a distinct people. Nothing sexy. So why does this theory get new legs every few decades and start to pick up steam all over again? Well, maybe because it's proven to be so useful to so many people. Confirmation bias is a powerful thing. If a group is motivated enough to want to latch on to a theory that's been debunked by multiple disciplines, they'll create a new basis on which to accept it. Originally, the theory was touted by eugenicists who wanted to undermine the Jewish faith. Then it was bolstered by Jewish writers who wanted to create a genetic separation between Jews and Jewishness to mitigate the harm of anti-Semitism. Since then, it's been fully embraced by anti-Semites and Holocaust deniers who now get to claim that they're only against fake Jews and imposters. But it's the same old BS that motivated the eugenicists and anti-Semites of old. The fact of the matter is you could disprove this theory six ways from Sunday and there will still be those who choose to give credence to it because it suits their purposes. Nevertheless, it's important to understand that Jewishness, as with any culture, goes beyond mere genetics. It's expressed in beliefs, practices, traditions, and a shared experience that can never be undermined by a false origin story, regardless of how enticing it still may be to some. Be sure to tune in to the next episode of the I'm All Over the Place podcast, where we'll have a frank discussion about the Khazar theory with biblical scholar Dan McClellan. You can follow the podcast at the link in my bio or in the description of this video.